So as we bring the, the panelists up, I'm going to introduce them. Um, Carolyn Suri, who uh, we know, Charles Suri is so important to the history of graphic arts as well as computer arts. She's the daughter uh, of uh, Suri and has got a wonderful practice in her own right. Benjamin Heidersberger, uh, of course, we, we heard um, Stefan talk about Hendrik uh, Heidelberger today. Um, he is an artist as well, so we'll hear um, some elements in terms of his practice and then his father's. And Hans Dillinger, as I said, a, a close friend of Roman uh, who has worked in the United States and was a professor at Kessel University, a pioneering computer artist. And Rainer um, Schnurzbiger, who uh, was a computer science and computer uh, pioneer. So you take a seat, guys. So thank you to Suzanne Pesch and the summit organizers for inviting me to share in the remarkable story of the digital pioneers. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So I grew up in a family of artists, and uh, when I was a teenager, I had the pleasure of uh, working in my father's uh, computer graphics lab. And later on, I graduated from Ohio State and uh, the computer graphics program. This is me working on the Amiga, believe it or not, with a floppy disk in the 80s. Um, and then I worked closely with my father throughout his career. A Charles affectionately known as Chuck was a professor of fine art, and at the same time he had one-man shows in New York. While he was in New York, he hung out with the avant-garde artists and writers at the Old Cedar Tavern Bar in Greenwich Village. And Chuck told me stories about the passionate and often heated exchange of ideas about art. Some of the notable abstract expressionists were Pollock, Rothko, William de Kooning, and Rauschenberg. In the 50s, uh, Chuck saw a grayscale raster image and was instantly determined to find a way to create art on the computer. Because there wasn't any software, uh, Chuck experiments with procedural drawings. Here you can see his point-by-point -point drawings simulating how he envisioned operating and thinking like a machine. Chuck is exploring technology through fine art in his paintings on the left, and at the same time he realizes his vision in the analog computer drawing on the right. Both images uh, experimented with image transformation. In 1966, Chuck goes across university departments and enlists programmer James Schaefer to help him realize his artistic vision of working on the computer. And then he learns, he goes and learns Fortran. There was only one computer at the university, and he recounted the excitement of seeing his plotter image for the first time, given the fact that there were no display devices. In the beginning, Chuck expressed to me that he felt very isolated in the pursuit of developing digital art and animation. In 67, he wins an international computer art contest with Sign Curve Men. In 68, he is part of the revolutionary ex exhibition Cybernetic Serendipity. This was validation for Chuck and other computer artists that they were on the path to something groundbreaking, revolutionary, and ultimately important. When in 68, Mama acquired Hummingbird, the animation, Chuck was wild with excitement. Still, Chuck was constantly facing pushback from the university and the art world. Here we see the rejection letter from Art Forum stating they can't imagine ever doing an article on art and science. It didn't age well. Still in 68, Surrey turns us into motivation by becoming the first fine artist in history to obtain a grant from the National Science Foundation. It was scandalous that an artist would get a grant in a scientific field. He was told to keep it quiet. Explosive discoveries are happening at this time, and Chuck goes to the engineering department and creates one of the first numeric milling machine sculptures. This is a pivotal light bulb moment for his vision to create 3D digital art and animation. Well, thank you very much. I have a deck if anybody wants to, <laughs> to review it. Thank you. 
the audience. I have to thank you for including me as a pioneer of the arts with uh, Herbert de Franke in connection. Thanks to Susanne that I'm here today. You see my memoirs connected with Herbert on this slide. I published it in 2022, and sadly he did not read it. He was already dead. And one with a more technological point of the future, the gods of informatics, also with a lot of Franke in it. So if you're interested on my personal view on meeting him over 45 years, then just have a look in the books. I'm dealing now with the continuation of uh, what is in the machine, what is in the work of Franke, bringing it to the now, and that's of course artificial intelligence. I made a movie White Noise on the book where I discuss et ethics uh, in it. So it's also connecting to a lot of elements of Franke, which you see in the next slide. He is talking in his work uh, dealing with the question of randomness. Can randomness be reproduced? How can it be reproduced? And uh, we find it now in the seed parameter, for example, in Midjourney or ChatGPT, that um, how to deal with the unexpected. And uh, as we give all the knowledge of the world to the machines now, if we want or not, it will be interesting to see where is uniqueness and where is plagiarism. So this is one of the points I can bring into this discussion, how can we be unique if the machine is doing it for us all. So, yeah, so that's uh, the point in the modern machine where we can control randomness by keystrokes. It was 1978 where he designed the machine on the Texas Instruments home computer and it has a lot of elements which are, which are now reinvented by artificial intelligence systems, giving it to the users in a different form as text prompts. So I think this is something of uh, big interest in the now to look back. And uh, yeah, my final quote to Herbert, thanks so long for all the fish he gave me in his life. So thank you. Yeah, welcome. <clears throat> I have this difficult double role now of being an artist myself and promoting my father's work as well. Uh, of course, I'm proud of my father, but also an artist myself. Um, uh, yeah, I was born 57, uh, studied physics, biology, computer science, uh, did some stuff in the interactive world, uh, basically co-invented at least social media with the Van Gogh TV Piazza Virtual in 1992. And I, right now I'm working on uh, an algorithmic piano composition, starting with the Big Bang and playing until the 16 trillion years into the future, tagging each moment of time. This is my father, whose life covered the whole 20th century, born in 1906, died 2006 with 105 weeks. Um, he was born in Ingolstadt, grew up in Linz in Austria, which connects him also to Franke, which I'm also personally met a lot of times at Ars Electronica. Went to Paris in 28 to study painting with Leger and later became an architecture photographer. So his main work is architecture photography. But he did some very interesting stuff in the 50s and 60s in generative art. Um, in 2002, Bernd Rodrian and I founded, with the funding of the city of Wolfsburg, the Institute Heidesberger to promote his work. He's the most well-known artist of the city. And uh, we have this nice castle there. And some of you will have the chance to see the institute and the uh, exhibition there, as well as his former atelier and uh, the machine that he used, also with some th stuff I did there. Um, these are the ma major collections his work can be found in. And now we see a movie uh, from 59. It's a newsreel showing him with one of his works uh, covering basically the connection of art and science. 
at the local university of Wolfenbüttel. Uh, he made a huge mural there that is still existing today. It's in German, I won't uh, translate, uh, just listen. The woman go moving from left to right is my mother at the time, I was two years old. Wie sehr die Technik auf Formen beruht, die in der modernen Kunst wiederzufinden sind oder umgekehrt, zeigen die Arbeiten des Braunschweiger Fotografen Heinrich Heidersberger. Es sind Aufnahmen magnetischer Kraftfelder, Rhythmogramme, Industrie- und Architekturfotografien. Es geht Heidersberger, der von der Malerei herkommt, um die Aufdeckung des Ästhetischen in den Formen, wie sie überall zu finden und aufzudecken sind. Ein Kugellager und ein künstlicher Blitz, eine Montage aus Negativ und Positiv bringt den optischen Reiz moderner Industrieformen verstärkt zum Ausdruck. Diese Aufnahmen finden zunehmend Verwendung in der modernen Gebrauchsgrafik. Die Perspektive zylindrischer Formen oder die Polarität in der Architektur sind ebenso reizvoll wie ein ganz einfaches Straßenpflaster. Für seine Rhythmogramme konstruierte Heidersberger eine Maschine, mit der er einen Lichtpunkt bewegt, der je nach Einstellung rhythmische Bewegung in unendlicher Vielfalt auf fotografische Platten zeichnen kann. There's a little bit of family story and also the, the mural we will see uh, on our trip to Wolfsburg at the Feno, which were, which were, where you just had an, a nice uh, reproduction of the work. So my father's inspiration came from Felix Auerbach in his famous book, uh, Physics in Graphical Displays from 1914, uh, where you see Lissa Jou figures already and he bought this book somehow and that got, got him inspired. Here's the mural again, 15 meter long, still existing. Um, and he used the rhythmograms as a kind of graphical elements to combine the dif 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 different disciplines of the university. Thank you. There's no pictures, but uh, uh, I just will recall some memories from my study time, which um, I'm, I'm 85 now. I was born 1939, so we grew up in the wartime. And I, I'm actually by profession a furniture maker. I worked as a furniture maker uh, several years. I uh, did a lot of work in the reconstruction of Stuttgart, Germany, as a carpenter. But um, later, there was a a possibility to get uh, into a university study with an uh, elementary school uh, degree, uh, which was uh, an uh, experimental program, and that's the way how I came to enter a university. And it was University of Stuttgart, and I uh, studied architecture. And I finished it, and I'm proud to be an architect. And my first job, right after I had uh, finished the diploma was the Olympic Village in Munich. Uh, the, one of my teachers said, you, you have to go there, you, uh, you do it. And uh, we, we did it, okay. Um, but later I, uh, I remember this time as a very, very interesting time and not knowing what a hotspot it was worldwide. Because, of course, we went into Benz's classes, Studium Generale, 
uh, you could at that time uh, study at the university wherever you wanted. So I listened to chemistry classes for a while. I went into uh, a class uh, to study Algol because they were the first computers and it happened it was the same institute uh, where Frieder Naker was working. There was no computing center at that time. It was called Institute for Numerical Mathematics. Uh, totally irrelevant to architecture, but interesting, and uh, we, ju we just decided to do it. Um, this is not possible today anymore if you go into a university, I think. But um, this time was extraordinarily interesting because uh, Benze and his teaching had a fundamental impact on my entire th <coughs> thinking. Uh, and also to the thinking of my classmates. Uh, we still talk about these things when we meet today. Um, one of his advices was, don't talk about art. It's too loaded. Use the term aesthetic event instead. And I follow his advice until today because it's much easier when I do these things which are called computer graphic today to, to view them as an aesthetic event. And my interest as an architect in this area came through the general interest in design. All, everything that has to do with design, the approaches, the methods. At that time, there was a, a, a lot of research and a lot of interest in this, in this topic. So design, the German word entwerfen is what, uh, what is asked for if you do some of these drawings. You, you design, you think about something, you write a program and, uh, and you judge the result and you change the program and you do it again. And it's, it's, it's a typical approach that architects use all the time. And usually we start in designing with a, with a sort of verbal uh, wording image. Yeah? Um, and the first program I was writing at, as a student, we had a, uh, to design a, a, a coffee in a, uh, near the seaside uh, in a cliff. And um, <laughs> I wrote a computer program which combined about two and a half thousand words uh, that if you read one of them, one of the lines, you would get an image in your head. So it was designing an image or a picture, a vivid picture in your head through words. Um, um, text to image, you would call it today. But uh, this is a very common uh, thing the architects all the way did at that time. Anyway, they still do it. And um, this program and I choose one line and made an, uh, a crude model and put it up. There was one week for this thing and then we had to present it. And I failed it gr in a grandiose way. There was an absolutely no chance that this two meter output from a computer uh, program and this crude model would, uh, would allow the teacher who offered this uh, to give a grade to me. But there was a discussion and it almost lasted two hours. And I remember that it was a very vivid discussion about possibilities of these things and computers, could they play a role in, uh, in this subject of architecture some way, someday. And one of my teachers, and I remember this really vividly, one of them whom I respected very highly ended this discussion with the following sentence. Maybe at the end, he may be right. And uh, uh, so this was my first approach to computers and it started, it continued. I was very lucky to get a scholarship to Berkeley and I went intensive, I stayed five years there and I did programming of all kinds of thoughts and I, especially used a language, and if there are some engineers are here, they will be starting
to laugh now. The, the language was developed by Bellabs and it was called Snowball 4. And Snowball was a, a programming language for the humanities and it was taught in Berkeley by an excellent teacher. And this, these were approaches I uh, was allowed to use at that time. And, uh, uh, and I used it for many, many years because you could, uh, it could handle text very easily. And when I looked at my computer programs, what you need in these old plotters, you, you need is a so-called Hewlett Packard code, HPGL. It's, it's to draw a line on, a, on this plotters is very easy. You have a pen and the pen, you, you have a command pen up, a command pen down, and a coordinate, coordinate it's going. That's, that's a line. And a, a drawing is just many millions or hundred thousand or hundred or fifty of those lines. Anyway, um, when I gave a talk in uh, Colorado on a conference, an international conference, uh, I um, in the discussion I was also asked, what sort of programming language do you use? And I uh, answered Snowball. And the, the entire aud audience was laughing because it was such a crude and unusual thing to, to use. Um, uh, but uh, at the time, for me, it was perfect. Uh, okay. I think time is over. So Um, just before we uh, go to lunch, a uh, well-deserved lunch, um, Susan just asked me if I want to ask uh, one simple question uh, to each of the panellists and that they can answer it uh, in the shortest term possible. And I suppose uh, what I, I would say in terms of my talk is, uh, you know, how do you, how do you imagine the future? Like, so... Uh, without having to put your practice into that context. But when you think of the future, what are you thinking about? Well, I would have to speak for my father. I think a lot of people don't realize how incredibly labor intensive it was to create computer art. Back in that time, it was like running neck deep in mud. And he recounted a time when a line moving across the screen people actually cheered and, and had a standing ovation. You know, chromey squiggle now, people would be fainting. Uh, but he, with all of this, uh, he had a level of perseverance that with every breakthrough, he could see the possibilities and, and the vision of the future. And he was also thinking about AI at a very early stage. And he really believed that we needed to look at, at this technology um, from a different point of view. Uh, so it has to be the unique way that an artist envisions things uh, because he predicted that it's going to get to the point where anybody can make art on the computer, but it takes a true visionary to do something very unique with this advanced technology. I would, I would just agree on it. And uh, if you want to know more, then I have the link on the website where I have my opening speech, four minutes. Yeah? So you can read it there, and it predicts also the future. So I hope we will be part of it. <laughs> um, difficult question, uh, but uh, for some time, uh, I see a trajectory from um, generative art to uh, artificial intelligence. And I'm really afraid of artificial intelligence and what it do to mankind. So I would like to remind the artists of their responsibility in their work. Uh, OK. Um, the question is really what, how I understood it. Are there any, what influences that you're thinking from the past into the future? And, I, I, uh, I cannot really, I could not really find a good answer. But I had, um, um, I, I thought about this, a model 
that is a, physic, phys, a physics model, and you probably know it. You have five steel balls, and you pick one, and you drop it, and the, the, the four stays silent, and the one goes up. It's, uh, uh, I, I have a picture, maybe you can see it here. Everybody knows this. And I think, I feel like myself being one of the four balls that don't move. <laughs> and there is, there is a cling from, from one side. And of course, the, it must go through you because the other ball is going up and it comes back. And so and I think maybe in society, we have something like this. Many balls go bump to us and we don't really realize, but eventually something happens and we make a step. Okay? And then we, we, really, we realize this. Okay? So that's all I want to say.